chapter 4. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn there, I've entitled this message, The Sin Within. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever bitten into an apple and found a worm on the inside of it? And yet there's, there's no entry hole on the outside, so you're trying to figure out how that worm got inside the apple. Well, scientists have discovered that the worm can actually come from within. So how does it get in? Well, it's really quite simple. An insect lays an egg in an apple blossom, and then sometime later the, the worm hatches on the inside of the apple, and then it begins to eat its way out. Several years ago, uh, California farmers were threatened with a potential disaster with the Mediterranean fruit fly. I don't know if you guys read about that. It probably entered the state uh, when someone who lied about not having any fruit crossed the border. Th then the, the larvae hatched and multiplied quickly, and it took a rapid, all-out effort to, to save California's fruit crop. As you may know, the larvae of fruit flies and other insects, do, they, just like the apple, they don't eat their way from the, from the outside in. Where the insect lays the egg in the blossom, and then the fruit actually grows around that blossom, then the egg hatches, and that worm just eats its way out. And see, that's the way sin functions. Tonight, I want you to get a real good idea of how sin works so that we can battle against it. Sin begins in the human heart. And it men, listen, if it's left unchecked, it will work its way out in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And so we have to take vigorous, quick action and, and so that sin doesn't establish a root in our heart. If you let sin go unchecked, then here's the warning. It will get an upper hand in your heart and life, and it can bring devastating consequences. And so tonight we're going to look at Genesis chapter 4. And I want you to see how, how that if you let sin go unchecked, it can lead to destruction and even death. So Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark or a sign on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now I want to stop right here. And so from this, from this passage of Scripture, I want us just to examine and get a really good feeling and understanding of how sin operates and the devastation that it, that it can bring. And so the question to begin with is where does sin begin? When you outline, sin begins where? From within. As we learned last week in your outline, Adam rebelled, when Adam rebelled against God and he ate from the wrong tree, sin and death became a regular part of our world. Remember, Adam was our representative. When he sinned, we all did what? Anybody remember? We sinned in him. Again, we would have done the same thing that he did. And so everyone who has been born since the day Adam was born um, has a sinful nature. We're, we're born with a sinful nature. Psalm 51 verse 5 is a very important verse in the Bible to remember. It's the only place that I'm aware of in the Bible where it uses the word conception or conceived. 
which, which said, has, makes a statement about when life begins. David writes, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You see, matter cannot sin. Only a human being can sin. And so what is God telling us about when life begins? A conception. And so the point that David was making here is that it, from the very moment of conception, we're born with this sinful nature, with this inclination to sin. We have this bent or this tendency to sin. Anybody want to argue with that? One of my favorite professors, you've heard me talk about him all the time, Dr. John Selhammer. Um, I remember one day in class, he was telling us about this time that he and his brother, they lived in California. I think he had just turned 16 and he wanted a car, so they went out and bought an old car. And they were driving it back home and they had a wreck. And in the wreck, the front axle was bent. And so the only direction that this car would turn in was to the left. So they had to drive home just making left turns to get home. He said they did this, but I don't believe they went in circles. But anyway, his point was that that car would only go in one direction. That was to the left. And he said, he, he told us, he said, students, that's the way where mankind is born. We're all born with a bent axle. We're, we're, we're born with this bent, this inclination to always be turning away from God. Would you all agree with that? That's why we, we sing that hymn sometimes. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. You see, when Cain was born, he was born with a sinful nature. His sinful nature was already there, just like that worm that was in the apple. And that worm began to eat its way out of his heart. Now, now don't you know that, listen, when, when Cain was first born, that Adam and Eve, Eve had great hope. You see, God had promised that from her seed, he would bring a deliverer, a savior. And I'm sure that they were thinking... Cain must be the one. Maybe Cain is going to make things right so we can get back into the garden. But how quickly their hopes were dashed. Now they also had another son by the name of Cable. And early on we can see that we, can, we get a glimpse of their hearts by, by their giving. You see, I'm sure that Adam and Eve, I'm, I'm, I believe that they raised them, teaching them that they were to give back to God. To show that they trusted God and they believed in Him. And so I'm sure they taught them to take some of your crops and take some of your flocks and you, you give a portion back to God. In your outline, giving back to God is how we show God that we believe in Him and that we're trusting in Him. And so it's, it's in their offerings that we get a glimpse into their hearts. The Scripture tells us that, that Abel brought some of the best portions from the firstborn of his flocks. While Cain, it just simply says that he brought some of his crops, some of the fruit from his crops. And Scripture tells us that, that the Lord looked with favor on Abel's offering, but not on Cain's. Why was that? What, what do you think, what was the difference between their offerings? Well, in your commentary you read this week, you probably learned this. Some scholars believe that, that the types of offering had everything to do with why God looked, at, uh, looked up on favor on Cain's, and, and, I mean, on Abel's, but not on Cain's. So what's the difference between their offerings? Well, um, some scholars believe that that the, all, the only offering that God would accept was, was an offering that was uh, from an animal that had been killed. It had to be a blood sacrifice. Going back to the time, you know, when God killed those animals, those sheep, and took the skins and clothed Adam and Eve's nakedness. But other scholars believe that it has nothing to do with the types of offerings because we will learn in Leviticus that God even accepts a grain offering. They argue that the, that the Lord God had, you know, had taught um, Adam and Eve when they killed the animals and provided skins to cover their nakedness, that God was teaching them that to come into his presence, you had to have a blood offering. And so what, what, I don't think it's, we have to be dogmatic about this. The bottom line is this. God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain's offering because of the condition of their hearts. Abel believed God. And Cain did not. Hebrews 11.4 states, By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks even though he's dead. You see, Abel, when, when you really dig into that verse, Abel brought the, the first fruits from his flocks. And he, he brought the choicest portions. While Cain just brought a sampling. And I, and I believe that he probably didn't bring the first fruits, the first harvest of his crops. So guys, let me ask you something. How are you doing on your giving? If, 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 if God were to go through, through your checkbook, if anybody were to go through your checkbook, what would that tell us about your giving? 
That's a hard question, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Do not build up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and with thieves breaking and steal. But build up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and with thieves do not break in and steal. Then he goes on to say, For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't take your money with you. Did you know you can send it on ahead? And so our giving, guys, is... God, it's not so much that God needs our money. It's just that our giving reflects the attitude of our heart. You, you're giving back to God just to show Him that you love Him, that you trust Him, and that you believe that He'll provide for you. And so, but, I mean, I want you to understand this truth in your outline. God is more concerned about our hearts than anything we do, including our giving. Attending church, participating in a Bible study like this one, or giving to good causes, these are good things. But if they're not done in faith, then they really accomplish nothing. Psalm chapter 51, verse 16 and 17 states, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. What, what is it about a broken and contrite heart? That, why, why does God love that? You see, a broken and contrite heart is one that actually grieves over its sin. Have you ever grieved over your sin? Now, God doesn't want, doesn't want us to stay there, but why does God like to see a man grieve over his sin? Do you know why? It's because when you're grieving over your sin, you're, you're, you're showing God that you believe Him, that you believe His Word, and you're also showing with great conviction that, you're, that you want to turn away from your sin and you want to walk in obedience to Him. In fact, someone once said that, and that's what repentance is. It's actually turning away from your sin and turning and walking with God. Someone once said that, that, that Christians should live in a constant state of repentance because we're always sinning. You see, this is what separated Cain from Abel. Abel believed God and Cain did not. And this sin that was so evident, Cain's heart began to eat its way out. Jeremiah 17, 9 states, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. John Owen wrote a book. In fact, Tommy Drake was in my office today and picked it up. It's called The Mortification of Sin. That word mortify means to kill. And he was a 17th century English theologian. And by the way, this book is only about 150 pages long, but it's a classic Everyone in here should read it. The Mortification of Sin. Here's what he said. He said, Temptations and occasions put nothing into a man, but only draw out what was in him before. Does that convict you? When I, when I look at my own heart, I just, I'm, I'm embarrassed at what come, the thoughts that proceed from my heart. I mean, even before I came in tonight, I was actually in my office with work, praise and worship music, and I had some... I'm not going to tell you, some thoughts enter my mind that shouldn't be there. And I just had to say, Lord, you know, take control of my mind and my heart. What does God see when He looks into your heart? Does He see the heart of Cain or the heart of Abel? You see, the sin in Cain's heart began to grow. First, he refused to really believe and trust God. And then once he realized that the Lord looked with favor upon Abel's offering, that worm in him became a worm of jealousy and anger and hatred. That worm began just to climb its way out. So men, to understand how sin functions and operates, you need to first understand where it comes from. It comes from within us, deep within our hearts. And secondly, in your outline, if that sin is left unchecked, that sin will continue to grow and take root. And so the Lord questioned Cain. He said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And then the Lord gave Cain a very helpful instruction. Look at what he says. If you do what is right, Cain, you, will you not be accepted? But if you do what is wrong, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And so when the Lord told Cain to do what was right, what was he giving him a chance to do? To repent. All Cain had to do was to confess the sin in his heart, and God would have forgiven him, and he could have gone back and started all over. He could have gone back and made a better offering. And see, that's all that God wants from any of us. All He wants us to do is to agree with Him that what we're doing is, is sinful, and then He will give us the strength to turn away from it. 
And so, men, I want you to understand this truth. Sin is crouching at the door of, of your heart. And listen, it was crouching at the door of your heart and my heart the moment we were born. And as we grow older, God gives each of us an opportunity over and over again to simply trust Him and walk with Him. In fact, the fact that some of you are sitting here tonight is maybe a chance that God has given you to trust Him, to walk with Him. But if we refuse to really trust God, we will become just like Cain. You see, Cain did not check the sin in his heart. Instead, he fed it, and it began to take root and grow. Did you know that um, if, you, if you starve a temptation, how do you starve it? Well, when the temptation presents itself, you turn away from it. And every time you turn away from it, you're starving it. And it just grows weaker and weaker and weaker in your life. But if you feed it, and you feed it by giving in to it, it will become stronger and stronger to the point where it will become a stronghold. Stephen Cole says, God pictures sin as a wild animal ready to pounce. It has a desire for you. It thirsts for your blood. It is your mortal enemy. But you must master it. Just as man was to have dominion over the beast, so he must now gain dominion over the beast crouching within, which is indwelling sin. Your one beer is harmless, but Satan knows how to create addictions. I know several young men right here in Raleigh in their 20s and 30s and 40s. You probably have some friends who are already alcoholics. I watched one beer in my father's life lead to cirrhosis of the liver over the course of 30 years and his death in a hotel room, divorced from my mother with all of his worldly possessions in that one room. And my father was very um, talented and smart. And he had a great opportunity business-wise. He declared bankruptcy. And all because that sin that began in his heart took deep root. You see, Satan is out to destroy us. One look at a porn site leads to hours on the Internet. Anybody ever experienced that? Don't raise your hand. One lie leads to a habitual lifestyle of lying. For what began with Tiger Woods as a temptation to cheat became a lifestyle that destroyed his marriage. What began as a lie in New York led to a Ponzi scheme and resulted in Bernie Madoff's imprisonment and his son Mark's suicide. It all began probably way back in Bernie Madoff's life with a little lie. And he began to lie more and more, to cover up. In your outline, Cain did not master sin and so sin mastered him. This is probably how I think this thing unfolded. Cain, you, you have known brothers that don't get along. I, I doubt Cain and Abel ever got along, probably because of Cain. And Cain saw that Abel was this perfect little boy. And I'm sure that just got on his nerve. And so that irritation in his heart began to grow until it became hatred. And then he desired to actually kill him. And so one day I think he just called up to his brother Abel, Hey, Abel. Hey, we haven't done much together in a long time. Why don't you come out? I've got some new crops I've grown. I want you to see how beautiful the fields look. Why don't you come out and let me show them to you? And Abel was probably thinking, well, and that's not like my brother. But maybe this is a new leaf he's trying to turn over. Maybe he wants to be a good brother from now on. So Abel followed him out to the field. And I, I can see Abel out there in that field leaning over to check out one of the plants that Cain was growing. And all of a sudden he felt a thud on his head and he, he collapsed on the ground and he felt another thud and then there was darkness and silence and he was dead. Cain ran and then out of nowhere the Lord was standing right beside him and, and the Lord asked him, Cain, where is Abel? And Cain replied, I don't know. It's not my day to keep up with him. That's the attitude I think that Cain had toward the Lord. The Lord said, what have you done with Cain? I can see Cain's blood. I can see Abel's blood in the field. See, God sees everything that we're doing. In your outline, the Lord sees everything. And not only that, He knows everything that we're thinking. Nothing is hidden from God. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 3 states, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Hebrews 4, 13 states, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. I mean, Cain's heart had become so hard that he did not even feel remorse over the murder of his brother. You see, this is the way sin works. It hardens the heart. It takes root in the man. And that root begins to grow and the man becomes more and more entangled and mastered by sin. 
So what happened? God, in essence, cursed Cain. I mean, we, we almost come to an understanding of how sin operates so that we can be better equipped to master it. Sin is our enemy. Satan is our enemy. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy. And the first way that sin operates is it begins within. And then if you leave it unchecked, it will grow and take root and it will master you. Sin that goes unchecked in your outline leads to devastation and separation from God. And it will, it will bring devastating consequences. And here are the consequences that came upon Cain. First, he was driven from the ground. Before Cain sinned, God had blessed his work and he'd been, able, he'd been a very productive farmer. Now he would no longer be, be a productive farmer. And because of that, his crops wouldn't produce. And so he became a restless wanderer on the earth. Basically a vagabond, a homeless man. And finally, and worst of all, he became separated from the Lord. See, that's what sin does if it's left unchecked. It will grow and become stronger. Sin is like an acorn. That if, you, if, you, if an acorn falls to the ground, you can quickly pick it up. Even a child can do it. And even if it is just sprouted, it's still rel- relatively easy to root out. But if you live, leave sin alone long enough, it will establish deep roots that will be very hard to, to uproot. It becomes like a stronghold. The Bible talks about strongholds in our lives. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It becomes like an addiction. John Owen writes, Sin lies as a worm at the root of obedience and corrodes and weakens it day by day. And so he asks, Do you, do you mortify sin? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will do what? It will be killing you. I want you to understand this. An unbeliever is already living his life independent of God. And so when he sins, all that sin is doing is driving him further and further away from God. He's built up this wall in his heart that, that's a wall that separates him from God. Verse 16 states, So Cain went out from the Lord's presence. I believe this is one of the saddest statements in the Bible. And yet, this is the destiny of so many people. If you resist God your entire life, then when you come to the end of your life, if, you ref- if you've refused His grace and mercy, then he'll, he'll have no choice but to tell you to leave His presence. Paul writes about this in first, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8-10. through 10. He writes, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power on the day He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Men, there are only two ways through this world. The way of Cain and the way of Abel. Cain's way is the way of the world. It's the way of independence. It's the way of self-reliance. It's the way of good works. It's the way of religion. It's the easy way. And men, it's the way most of the people that you and I know are taking. Abel's way, it's the difficult way. It's the way of dependence upon God. It's the way of confession and repentance. It's the way of contrition and brokenness. It's the way of surrender. It's the way of the cross. And it's the, it's the way that only a few people ever find. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So let me ask you, which road are you on? The wide road? Or the narrow road. And we learned that Cain married and gave birth to Enoch, that his wife did. And then he began to build a city. And this line continued until Lamech was born. And it appears that each succeeding generation became more and more evil. Until you, we will see in Genesis chapter 7 and 8, the flood, God has to send a flood. Lamech was arrogant and boasted before God. And that's what said that he was ten times greater than Cain. And all looked hopeless. Cain had chosen to go his own way. And Abel was, Abel was dead. And so it looked like this righteous line had been severed. But all was not hopeless. You see, God is a God who keeps His promises. And God had promised this in Genesis 3.15. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike His heel. 
Cain was the seed of, of, of the serpent. Not the ultimate seed, but he was a seed of the serpent. Whereas Abel was the seed, was the righteous seed. And when Abel died, things looked bleak. But then Adam lay with his wife and gave birth to Seth, who took the place of Abel. The righteous seed of the woman was kept intact. Seth was, the, was a righteous man. It's interesting to look at the, the line of Cain and the line of, line of Abel. Lamech came from Cain, and he was a very evil man. Noah, on the other hand, came from the line of Seth, and he was a man who did everything right. And when we come to the end of Genesis 4, we learn that men began to call on the name of the Lord. There was hope again. The seed of the woman was still alive. Did y'all know that you can follow the line of the seed all the way through the Bible? Did you know that? And here it is in your outline. God created Adam. Adam gave birth to Seth. Seth gave birth to Noah. And this is not the outline, but one of Noah's sons was Shem. And so from Shem came Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. And just before Jacob died, by the way, his name was changed to Israel. Just before Israel died, he, he called in his 12 sons one at a time and he blessed them. And it's interesting what he said to Judah when Judah came before him. This is in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10 and 11. So Jacob is getting ready to bless Judah and he says this, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the rule of staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. He will tether his donkey to a vine. He will, he will work his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. And so what, what um, Israel was prophesying of his son Judah is that the scepter, which is the rule of, which is a king's staff, that the one that it belonged to, which would be who? Jesus, was coming one day from the line of Judah. And so from Judah, you, you, you have Obed, David, Zerubbabel, Nahum, Levi, Joseph, and then Jesus. Now I skipped a bunch of generations. But you can find those in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. This is the righteous line, the seed of the woman that comes all the way to Jesus. Now let me tell you something then. You can become part of that line. Did you know that? You, be, you can become part of that line just simply by placing your trust in Jesus. Have you done that? Or are you on the, the narrow road? Jesus was the seed who crushed the head of Satan at the cross. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for all of our sins. That's why He came into the world. Hebrews 9.22 states, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So men, which road are you on? Are you on the road of Cain or the road of Abel? And let me, ask, let me leave you with this thought tonight. What kind of offering can we give to God? You know, you know what He wants from us more than anything else? He wants our hearts. He wants our obedience. Jesus said, those who love me, obey me. So men, let me ask you, have you surrendered your heart to Jesus? Have you placed your trust in Him? Are you on the narrow road? Do not mean on the narrow road. If you're not sure, you place your trust in Jesus before you go to bed tonight. He'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you can know that when you die, you'll step into paradise. Would you pray with me?